Isn't the Lord wonderful? All the time. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Book of Revelation, chapter 20. Thank you, Lord. Revelation. By the way, in case you don't know this, the book of Revelation is not a revelation about the devil or about the Antichrist and about how great he is. It's almost like people worship uh, some figure called the Antichrist or something. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says you are blessed if you read this book. Hallelujah. You are going to help me out tonight, aren't you? Yes. It is a, the word revelation means an unveiling. It's an unveiling of Jesus in all of his majesty, in his glory, and in his victory, and the victorious church that he has made us. Say amen to that. Amen. You got your faith out tonight, huh? Yes. Yes. I'm going to be ministry tonight. Of course, uh, you know, we're big on the gospel. Yes. And uh, Paul, you know, Paul was big on it. He was so big on it, he called it my gospel. He said, if anybody preaches any other gospel but mine, he said, let them be accursed or downed, anathema in the Greek. Yeah. And I don't know, my mama didn't raise no fool, so I just figured, I'm going to go with Paul. <laughs> you, you can go with who you want to, but I think I'll just stick with Paul. And he calls it the gospel of grace. In John 1, the Bible says... Somebody shout the Bible. Yeah. And we go by the Bible, by the way. I believe the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. Yeah. It is the book for me. That's where my life is. It is in Him I live, move, and have my being. In fact, God so honors the Word, He calls Himself the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. His name is Jesus, God in the flesh. The living Word of the living God. Yeah. He said that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth. Notice which side the truth is on. And what will the truth do? It makes you free. Yes, yes. Notice the truth wasn't on the side of the law, and the law is holy. It is pure. God made it. It's pure. But it has a function. It is not there to make you holy. It can't make you holy. It is not there to make you righteous. It cannot make you righteous. It is not there to clean you up. It cannot clean you up. It is there as a schoolmaster to show you all your imperfections and point you to Jesus. Amen. That we need Jesus. We don't live by the law in the new covenant. Jesus is our life. Yes, and he lives through. I don't live for God. Because I just want to live for the Lord. Yeah. I was raised in church. We just want to live for the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> but can I tell you. You can't live for. I don't know about you. Even as a preacher. I'm gonna, I can't live for God. But Paul says it's not I that live. It's Christ in me. Yeah. That lives this thing. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's why Jesus said that if you are heavy burdened and you're laboring out there trying to do this thing, he said, come unto me and I'll make it even harder. No, 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 no. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke. Hook up with me. Hook up with me and I'm going to give you rest. God wants us to enter into a divine rest. And Jesus, grace is not a subject, grace is the gospel. Huh. I want to minister to you, and when you get the revelation of grace, Paul says that by one man, Adam, his sin and offense caused death to come and reign over all men. The literal Greek says to reign like a king over all men. He says, but by one man, Christ Jesus, by one man came the gift of righteousness, you can't work for it, and the abundance of grace. Yes. Glory to God. And he says, by offense 
and by sin, they abounded by one man. Offense did abound and sin did abound by one man, Adam. But much more than that, grace yes. did abound. Yes, amen. Here's the secret to that verse. The Greek word is different for the abound of offense and sin. It came in the word abound there means increase. But it changes when it talks about what Jesus did. What Adam did, the offense, the sin abounded, it increased, it grew. But then Jesus came. Somebody shout, thank God for Jesus. But Jesus came. And much more powerful than what the first Adam did, the last Adam came. And the Greek word there means hyper, abundant, exceedingly overflow beyond your expectations. Beyond powerful. This thing is more powerful than what sin could ever do. In fact, if you've got sin in your life, you're in the right place. Jesus, I'm for you. I love you, man. Come on. But 
What does the word of God say? Just because I loved him. Because grandma, I grew up with a wonderful grandma, but grandma can tell you things that will freak you out. And I, well, an angel appeared to me, son. Said a great, great thing is coming against the earth and he's going to judge all of his people and many of us will be killed for the gospel's sake and he's going to destroy us all and great plagues is coming on all the church and uh, Grandma, I love you. <laughs> but that wasn't the right kind of angel that came and appeared to you. Because Grandma was wrong and the angel was wrong. Because the Bible says you've got to beware because there can be angels of light that will appear to you. And we love Grandma and I believe in angels, but you better watch what kind of angel you're listening to. Does it? We believe in visions. We believe in the supernatural. But I want the kind that lines up with the Word of God. Don't want nothing from no devil. I said, don't want nothing from no devil. That devil's a liar. Look, tell somebody say, you're not going to be deceived. You're not going to be deceived. You're not going to be deceived. But you'd be surprised. People have been saved for years and years. I've come up to me and they've told me that God's judging the sickness and he's teaching them something. Do you know? And, and people will pray something. They pray curses. They pray curses like, Lord, if, if you have to, my husband, you, you know, he don't love you, he's not serving. If, if you have to burn his business down, if, if you have to destroy his business, Lord, to, to, to get him to come to me, just to, just to do right, Lord, do what you have to do. You have just opened the door for the devil. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, neither give place to the devil. Those are curses. I said, those are curses. No, the Bible says in the book of Romans, the goodness of men. He says, who has despised God's riches? It is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Not burning their business down, not giving them cancer. First of all, where would he get it? You'd have to have it to get it. Here's what's going to help you understand the Bible. And understand and open your eyes. Huh. There is an Old Testament and a New Testament. Here's what it means. The old is old and the new is new. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says, it is a new and better covenant established upon better promises. If it's new, I want it. And if it's new and better, I really want it. Because they had the blood of bulls and goats, but we got the blood of God Almighty. That, of course, out of Jesus' side and out of his hands and out of his feet and out of his brow that day. That was not the blood of a man. It was the blood of God Almighty. Yes. Yes. Huh. I don't know about you, that's what I want. Yes, amen. Huh. Under the Old Testament, they had the law. And if you messed it up, they had a blessing and a cursing. You had to keep it to get the blessing. Under the New Testament, Jesus kept it so you could get it. Because under the Old Testament, if you missed it one time, curse would come on you. But in the New Testament, Paul said in Galatians 3.13, Christ has become the curse for us, so the blessing of Abraham shall come on all of us. We do not have a curse in the New Covenant. It doesn't belong to you. You shouldn't be having no curse. That's right. That's right. And God's not going to teach your kids with sickness and disease. No. And oh, Isaiah prophesies about it. And he says, the Lord says, all your children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be their peace in undisturbed composure. Your children are told of the Lord. Your children, my children, say that with me, are told of the Lord. Not by judgments. The word judgment literally means condemn. The word condemnation and judgment is the same Greek word. It, it, it means to terrorize. It means to condemn. It is a legal term. It means to imprison. Jesus said, I have not come to condemn the world. I have come to save the world. I've not come to condemn the world. I've come to save the world. I've not come to judge. I've come to set free. Yes, yes. Am I preaching right about it? Yes, yes. And all through the Bible, we'll see verses in the new covenant 
where Paul says in Colossians, you are complete in Christ. Now, when you get to heaven, you're complete now in Christ Jesus. Yes. I'm not talking about the outward man. I'm not looking at the outward man. I'm looking at the inward man who is in Christ and Christ in me. And we are joined together with him. Somebody shall I'm complete. I'm not when you get to heaven right now. Say right now. Right now. Give yourself say right now. Right. We are complete right now. Not going to get it. We are complete right now. Right. Yeah. Hmm. He says all through the Bible, we're not condemned. He's made us righteous in Christ Jesus. He's given us the abundance of grace. He's given us the gift of righteousness. He says that the Amplified Version of Romans 5, 17, where he says he's given us the gift of righteousness. Righteousness means this. Righteousness is what you do. It's who you are. Righteousness means you are right. Righteousness means you have a right to stand in God's presence because of the blood of Jesus and Christ in you and the new birth. You are just as holy and as pure and as right as Jesus himself. His blood has done away. It does not cover your sin. It does away with your sin. His blood recreates you. The Old Testament, the blood of animals covered. We got an even better covenant. It cleanses us. It does away, not only with my sin, it did away with the old you and the old me. Paul says, I was crucified with him. I died with him. I was buried with him. But I was also raised with him and seated with him at the right hand of the Father. Lord above every principality, power, and might, dominion, and every name that's in this world. And not only this world, but the world to come. And we are the fullness of his body, who is our head, all in all. Glory to God. How much more closer can you get? We're holy of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Paul said, he that is joined into the Lord is one spirit. We have the mind of Christ. How much closer can you get? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How do you see yourself? How does God see you? We have got to understand how God relates to us. See, when you go to God, because, let me finish what I was going to say a while ago. He said, he's given us the gift of righteousness, so I have a right. It means to be free from guilt and shame and condemnation. Yes, yes. You never have to be guilty. You never have to walk around with guilt. You never have to walk around with shame. In fact, in Isaiah, he said, for your shame, I'll give you double. Prophesying about the church. For your shame, I'll give you double. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. He says, I've given you the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace, the Amplified Version says, so you can reign like a king in this life. You will reign over sin. You will reign over sickness. You will reign over disease. You will reign over poverty. Yes. And you will reign over everything hell can throw against you. Yes. Yes. That's why you must know you're right. If you don't know you're righteous, yes. you'll walk around feeling like you're no good. I blow it again. I always blow it. I'm always a screw up. I'm always a mess up. And you'll walk around with coming I can't pray after what I did. I can't pray for somebody else after what I did. I can't go back to church after what I did. And if you do, you just sit there and endure it. Won't take the Lord's Supper because you're such a mess up. You ain't no mess up. Paul says in Philippians, you're blameless. Paul says in Colossians, you're complete. Hallelujah. Paul says in Ephesians and Colossians that he has given us redemption and has forgiven all of our sins. Past, present, and future. You are the redeemed of the Lord. And he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. See what God says about you. You're not a sinner. I'm redeemed. Jesus has made unto me righteousness. Jesus has made unto me sanctification. Jesus has made unto me redemption. Jesus has made unto me wisdom. I wish somebody would shout. <laughs> Hebrews 4 16, he says, Come boldly to the throne of grace. When Presley said, says the throne of love gives. Yeah. The word grace means unmerited favor. It's not based on what you did. It's based on everything what he did. Yeah. Religion and law was teach you do, do, do. The new covenant is done, done, done. Yeah. And there's so many angles of uh, scripture. You know, Paul says we see the length, the depth, the breadth, the height of this thing. 
And here's what the Lord and I never saw from this angle about coming to the throne of grace. Now, number one, notice he didn't say it's the throne of judgment. It's not the throne of law. It's not the throne of accusation. It's not the throne of condemnation. It is not the throne of finger pointing. It is the throne of grace. Yes, yes. His love for you. Amen. Everything he's done belongs to you. And he says you can come boldly. In other words, when you know it's a throne of grace and the Father loves you and deals with you and relates to you as someone who is pure, who is holy, and is cleansed, not based on what you've done, based on what Jesus did, and he smiles at you. The Bible says, the blessed God in the New Testament. Do you know the word blessed means happy? Do you know God's happy? Do you know he smiles? Do you know Zephaniah prophesying about our day says that our God will literally dance over you with joy and thanksgiving? Where did you think dancing came from? Did it come from Michael Jackson? <laughs> Michael could kill a rug, but man, whoa, glory to God. What Man, wouldn't you like to see God dance? Your father, he dances over you with joy and thanksgiving. He knows how to sing, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Glory to God. You will get to hear him sing one day. Glory. Watch him dance. Glory. Man, yeah. you grow up as a, a, a swamp and he dances. What do you think it looks like in heaven? Yeah. What do you think Jesus yeah. looks like dancing? Yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. Woo, you got all that up in your feet today. Thank you. And we're just going from glory to glory. Yes. My Lord, we'll be running down yes. the aisles up in this hotel pretty soon. <laughs> Outside. <laughs> I'm telling you, we had revival in our church eight weeks. And when the Holy Ghost hit me, I ran out the side doors, ran out the street, started screaming and shouting, ran around. Good God Almighty. Ran back around, Frank came through the front door. Whoa, Jesus. Something got on me. You ever had something get on you? You ever had the anointing get on you? I'm about to have one right now. I feel something coming up.
He's got a bat in his hand ready to knock you upside the head. And he's got this mean look of, how did you see him? And I, 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 I walk in there and I, and I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm stuck. <laughs> the Holy Ghost came and she got stuck on the floor. Well, I'm no fool. I just laid down next to her and said, lay your hands on me. And then I got stuck. <laughs> oh, we breathe together. We're dancing buddies. Shouting buddies. Praying buddies. How does God relate to you? When I come to the throne, when I realize it's a throne of grace, and God's not against me, but God's for me. And if God be for you, who can be against you? And if God's going to be abundance of grace, super abounding, exceedingly abundantly above what I can ask or say, it gives me boldness to go to the throne and believe God for whatever he said is mine. Devil, take your hands off my money. Take your hands off my body. Take your hands off my children. Take your hands off my body. Take your hands off my business. Turn it loose in Jesus. Come on up in here, church. God is You've got to see in Hebrews. He says, I will remember your sins and trespasses no more. Yes. Old Testament, under the law, he says your sins and trespasses will be passed to your children and your children's children to the third and fourth generation. New Covenant, he says, I won't remember your sins and transgressions anymore. He's already paid past, present, and future. And in the future, he's not saying you're going to get forgiven again. He's already done it. By stripes you were healed, your sins were forgiven, you were completed in him. Ephesians says, chapter 1, that he has given us redemption and forgiveness of sins. Not going to, has. Colossians 1, 13, 14. He says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son and has given us redemption and has forgiven us of our sins. So what do we do when we do something wrong, preacher? We say, Lord, I want to thank you that 2,000 years ago you shed your blood and you forgave me and you cleansed me. And I want to thank you that you are my righteousness and I have the righteousness of God flowing inside of me. That's why in Romans 6, 14, he says that sin does not have dominion over you for you're not under the law, but under grace. When you get the revelation of grace, you have dominion over sin. It no longer has dominion over you. And the word sin there is a noun. It means sickness. It means disease. Uh, uh, disease. It means lack. It means poverty. When you get the revelation of grace, you can walk in boldness and know you have dominion over sin, sickness, disease, poverty, and anything hell could ever throw against you. Yeah. Who am I prophesying to? Yeah. Help me get to this tonight, Lord. So we see all these scriptures that are positive about us. And one little scripture may look like God's manager or God's going to do something to you or against you. And we forget all the other scriptures based on one scripture. Based on one scripture, the Bible, the Bible, hmm, it's not against itself. It doesn't contradict itself. No, so if something seemingly looks different than the, all the other verses, then you have to pray, believe the Holy Spirit will show you, read the whole context. Because what preachers do, they'll pull scriptures out of context that looks, for instance, all the Bible is for us, but not all the Bible is about us. All the Bible is yes. for you. Yes. I'm getting ready to read something here that's not about you. It's not a, all, the, all the Bible is for us is to read and understand. But it's not all about me. For instance, Paul writes in Ephesians and preachers of preach. Use this and pull judgment 
a condemnation scripture out to beat God's people up. Used to do it myself. Didn't know any better. Don't you know that the intimidate, the thieves, the drunkards, none of them will have their place in the kingdom of God. So if you're drinking, you're no good. Till the enemy, you sin, you failed. And preach that to God, sir. Wait a minute. You're taking that out of context. And when you take a scripture out of context, you get conned. Here's what the whole thing says. The infeminate, those that steal thieves, the drunkards. He said, don't you know they have no place in the kingdom? And he says, and such were past tense. Yes. Some of you. But now you are created in righteousness and true holiness. So now put on that new man that's created in righteousness and true holiness and let him rule. His whole point was that's not who you are. Stop thinking like that and think like you are. You're not that anymore. You were that, but now you're a new creation and you're righteous and you're holy. Let that man arise. Good God Almighty. Yeah. So, so. Hmm. In fact, man, I didn't expect to go this long, but the Holy Ghost is just, things was bouncing out of my spirit today. I thought I wasn't even going to get to come to that because I just had things just coming out of my spirit. Oh, God, you're so good. It's going to take me five years to preach all this. But just mark this down. Revelation 20. Verse 11 through 15, he said, there's a great white throne of judgment. He said, the dead will be brought up before the white throne of judgment. The great white throne of judgment. And God will open the books of life and everybody's name that's not found therein will be cast, hell and death will be cast into the lake of fire. Hell, Hades. And death will be cast into the lake of fire. He said, this is the second death. What is the second death? What is the second death? It is when those who are lost, you will not be here. You will not be at the white throne of judgment. No, you won't. No, you will not. You will never be there. It is for those who have rejected Christ. That's the only sin, by the way, a person goes to hell for. Yeah, right. He said, when the Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll, he'll do this. He'll convict of sin. Right. Singular. They believe not on me. The reason a person goes to hell is not because they committed adultery in that sin. I'm against sin. This church is against sin. We don't believe in sin. We're totally against sin. So that's why I preach on grace so you'll have victory over it. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Amen. Amen. Titus, Paul writes to Titus and says that grace teaches us to live a sober life and a godly life. Yes. Grace yes. does. Keeping the law will not make you righteous. It's like looking in the mirror. It points out all your faults. You look in the mirror and see all your faults, all your pimples, all your imperfections. <laughs> but take your face and rub it on the mirror and see what happens. Nothing. You're still ugly when you get in the mirror. You just got your pimples and Put some more makeup up there and hair and I'll pull this back and take this back and pull this up and whatever it takes. <laughs> but grace changes us, recreates us, and makes us into the image of his son. Yes, yes. People says you're light on sin. I said, no, I'm heavy on the sun. Yes. You're light on Jesus. I'm heavy on Jesus. Preaching on sin. You know how to sin. Why do you need me to tell you about sin? Come on, amen. I'm here to tell you about the solution. Amen. Yeah. The victory. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that victory stuff. Yeah. How much God has loved victory? Yes, yeah. oh, yeah. God. Glory to God. Oh, Lord. <laughs> mm. Hell 
the word Hades. When a person dies now and they don't know the Lord, see the Holy Spirit comes and he convicts you. It's not because you committed adultery, you're a drunkard, or any of the big bad ten. Or the little ones. Because what we call big and little, God just says sin. Huh? Because we'll point out everybody else, whoa, look at that, but we don't look at our little thing. See, it's little to us. You ever read Galatians when he calls the works of the flesh? See, it's the, it's, it's, that's it. See, the works of the flesh, the flesh. It's not how, and he talks, he talks about gossiping and murmuring. In the same breath, he talks about lasciviousness and licentiousness. Go look that up in a dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I first heard reading the Bible, I didn't know nothing. And I saw that word lasciviousness. I didn't know what it meant, but it, ooh, it sounded bad. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one day, I hope Webster is in heaven. They wrote the dictionary. Because I looked up lasciviousness, and when I got there, it said licentiousness. <laughs> so I turned and I looked up licentiousness. That's what it said, lasciviousness. <laughs> I said, when I get my hand, <laughs> so we said, oh, that adultery, that sex stuff, oh, that's bad. And we're, we're not for immoral living. I'm telling you, see, if you got to close, the way we, law gets you to put you better do right, you're better, and you're gritting your teeth, I'm going to do everything I can today, I'm not going to do it, and you're by sheer willpower. If you got to do it by willpower, then by willpower, you have to keep it. Come on. Yeah. And that's a hard road to toe. Because I've tried it, and I know other people have tried it, and you just can't do it. Maybe a little while, but not very long. Because he didn't tell me to live by willpower. He told me to live by grace power and Holy Ghost yes. power. Yes. The Spirit of God. Yes. We live by the Spirit of God. Yes, yes. And that makes us overcomers. The Christ in me makes me an overcomer. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. I'm trying to help you. Because if your willpower will keep you from that sin right now, then you've got to stay in willpower to stop you tomorrow. Yes. But Peter says we are kept by the power of God. Yes. 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 We are kept yes. by the power of God. Yes, amen. Not by my ability. Unmerited favor that Christ gives us. And the Holy Spirit doesn't come and convict you of a sinner of that. He's a sinner. He can't help it. Now, I'm an old country boy from North Louisiana. You know, when and cows lived in our yard, we had cow patties everywhere. We used to stick fire. My, we'd get my, my cousin and me, we'd get our youngest cousin, we'd come over there and say, You gotta come see. We'd put firecrackers, and just as they come, we'd take off running. Boom! Head to toe. Cow patty. Good God. I know it wasn't right, but I'm forgiven. <laughs> we had chickens and cow. When Grandma wanted to make chicken, and we had an outhouse. We, we didn't have toilet paper. We had a Sears and Roba catalog. I'm telling you, with my right hand up. And, and then we really moved up. We got one of those white buckets later and moved that to the house. Woo! We were uptown. We got God. But I never saw a cow out there going. Lord, just give me a good move. <laughs> I just wish I could move. Everybody else moves. I, wish, I just wish they just move. They don't try to. You ever notice a dog? Don't try. He barks. That's his nature. Ain't never heard one meow. If I do, I'm running the other way, Jack. <laughs> It's the nature. That's what it's all about. It's a nature change. Why is it when you're born again, all of a sudden, I used to want to drink. I used to want to run around. I tell people now, I go to all the triple X movies I want to. I drink all the whiskey I want to. I cuss and scream all I want to. I just don't want to. I gotta be want to. I got saved and woke up the next morning and I didn't want to. I wanted to be in love with Jesus. I loved him and I didn't even know how it happened. He came inside of me and loved me and came his son for me and freed me and delivered me. Ain't he a good God? It's your nature. It flows out of you. And he said, the Spirit
Spirit of God will convict of sin, singular, that they believe not on me. This is in John chapter 8. That they believe not on me. Why? Because Jesus is the only way of salvation. Not the law. Not going to church. Not reading your Bible. And it's good to read your Bible. You should read your Bible. It's your love letters. And we need to go to church and fellowship with one another. But not because God's mad at me if I miss church. Huh? It kind of reminds me of that story of that man. His wife woke him up Sunday morning and said, Honey, get up. It's time to go to church. He said, I ain't going to church. She says... Come on, you know you're you're a Christian. You, the Bible says, "Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together." You know you're supposed to go to church. He said, "I know it, but I don't want to." She said, "He says, she says, tell me why you don't want to go to church." He said, "I can't stand those people at church." <laughs> she says, "You're supposed to go." He says, "Just give me a good reason I'm supposed to go." She said, number one, you're the pastor. Do you think I'll go to hell if I miss going to church? No. Would you go to hell if you missed? Or you didn't read your Bible? Did you know if you never read your Bible again, if you never tithed again, if you never gave an offering, if you never came to church again, did you know Jesus would still be head over his heels in love with you? Yes. But when you're a sinner and you didn't read your Bible, you wasn't going to church, and you wasn't going, oh, hallelujah, and you wasn't saying all the religious little cute things, and you wasn't doing all the little spiritual things, and Jesus gave himself for us. Isn't it something in other religions, you got to suffer to get their God's appeasement. You've got to sleep on hard floors. I was listening to a minister and powerful grace preacher in Hong Kong. And he's from Australia. And he has like 30,000 people in his church in Hong Kong. But they're sort of preaching grace. And he, he said he used to be a Hare Krishna man when he was like 23. And later become a Buddhist monk. Just searching. And he said, as a Hare Krishna, he said, I'm married. He says, but he says, I wouldn't sleep more than three. He said, if I slept four hours, I thought it was bad. He said, because I wasn't suffering. I had to suffer to be able to go to the heaven I believed in and to appease my God and make my God like me. And he says, and then I'd get up and pray four or five hours. And then we'd go hand out tracts trying to convert others to Harry Krishna. And he says, and then I was sleeping on a mattress. And I said, no, this is too good on the floor. So I got rid of the mattress, slept on a blanket. And he said, no, no, this is too hard. And he, and he says, I, I got to please my God. So he said, I just slept finally just out in the dirt. Isn't it something other gods in other religions make you suffer to get what they got? Right. To get to their heaven. Mm -hmm. But isn't it something our God yeah. suffered for us yeah. so we can get to his heaven? Yeah. That Jesus, who was rich, became poor. He became poor in poverty. He took your sin. He took our sickness. He took our deliverance. He took all that on him and cast out of the person
Jesus said, those who have sinned most will love most. That doesn't mean you have a bigger sin than me. It means when you realize how big your sin has nothing to do with the horrible things you did. It was when we're in the world and we don't know Jesus, we're a child of the devil and we're on our way to hell. Because you get your Lord's judgment. And if Satan is your Lord, whether you call him Lord or not, Jesus said you're up your father and the devil. And you get his judgment. His judgment is hell. God didn't make hell for man. He made it for the devil and his angels. Yes. Never made it for man. So when a person dies that doesn't know the Lord, they go to hell today. They know the Lord, they immediately go to heaven. But there's coming a time at the great white throne judgment, he calls it the second death, where hell and all those that are in it will come before the throne of God and now will be judged for their works. And they will be thrown, watch this, into the lake of fire, Greek word Gehenna. Hell itself is like if you break the law, they'll bring you to the county jail. And then later on, if it's real bad, they'll bring you into the court and then send you to the federal prison. The county jail is like hell. It's a real place. It's a place of torment. It really has fire right now. It's horrible. You don't want to go there. But then, as bad as that is, he said, it's worse. There's coming a day, the great white throne judgment, where if you're not feeling written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Hell and everything in it will be belched up, stand before God, and then be thrown into Gehenna, the lake of fire that burns with brimstone forever and ever. But good news! Oh, if you're, are you in Revelation 20? Look up in verse 6. Blessed! That word means happy, fortunate to be in thee. Blessed and happy is he who, which has part in the first Resurrection. Mm. On such, the second death has no power. Those that had part in the first resurrection, when you was born again, you took part in what Jesus took part in. The first resurrection was when he died on the cross and came up out of that grave and was raised from the dead. The Bible says you were raised with him. And now the second death can never, ever have any power over you. You're never, ever going to hell. You cannot lose your salvation. You will not lose your salvation. You will not go to the lake of fire. You will live with Jesus forever and forever. You must get in your mind. How does God relate to me? He's laughing. He's smiling. He's happy. And he sees me righteous. He sees me as pure as Jesus. And when I pray and come to him, that's how he relates to me. He doesn't look at me. We used to have, I don't know if you've ever seen them little chick tracks or something. And, and some of them are good. And I'm putting them down. Thank God for anybody that does anything for the Lord. But some of them, they got stuff on their life. They show you messing up. And when you die, they show you up in heaven, and all of a sudden God goes, stand here. And they got billions of people standing behind you, and God, boom, and there's a huge screen up there, and God just starts putting all of your sins up there. And just goes, just looking at you. That's never, ever going to happen. Let me tell you what happens. When you stand before God and the Lord says, pull up Danny's pull up Danny's life from beginning to end. Righteousness, 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 holy, 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 holy. Terry, pull up Terry. Righteousness, 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 holy, 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 redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. The blood of Jesus is a better thing than the blood of Abel. Oh, somebody help me up here. Look, look with me. 
me real quick over here. And, uh, are you glad you came tonight? Yes. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Second. Oh, Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Man, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Here's the secret to reading the Bible and understanding it. Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2.15. said, Timothy, a young pastor, rightly divide the word of truth. Here's a dividing line, Old Testament, New Testament. It's a new meta covenant. Here's a dividing line, John 10 and 10. Jesus said, it's the thief that steals, kills, and destroys. Yes, yes. You'd be surprised how many people still come up to me and say, well, I, I don't know why God did this. Or sometimes it's a subtle form. Some, some preachers will, or religions and say, well, oh, we didn't say God did it, but he allowed it. No, if he could have stopped it. But there's something about you. You're special. How many of you wish you wasn't that special? Just trying. Just trying. God's not the one that tries you and tests you. He knows. He said, oh, he's got to see what you're going to do. God knows what you're going to do. He's God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. It is the enemy that tried the word. Let Jesus let no man say. Let no man say. Touch yourself and say, that's me. When he's tempted, the word tempted in the Greek, and if you get uh, amplified other ones, or the Greek, it says tempted, tested, and tried. It's the same word. Let no man say, when I'm tempted, tested, and tried, I'm tempted, tested, and tried of God. For God cannot tempt, test, or try any man with evil. For he is the father of the lights, and only good and perfect gifts come from above. We're quoting scripture. We're not quoting religion. Right. He is the father, not of darkness. He's the father of light. Yes. He's not God to you. He's father to you. Yes. Yes. And he's the father of lights to yes. you. Yes. And this is how he relates to you. Yes. Only good and only perfect gifts come from above. I don't know about you. And religion will even tell you. I read a thing one time. And they said, well, who told you cancer couldn't be a good thing? I thought, who told you you weren't a dummy? I thought, you got to begin. Who told you your house been destroyed? Oh, if our house wouldn't have been destroyed, if we wouldn't have lost our car, if we didn't lose everything, we just wouldn't have lost. Now, look, now I know in those situations, a lot of times we can run to God. And thank God for that. And if any of that happened to you, let me tell you, God didn't do it, but God will restore it. Yes. Yes. If it still kills and destroys, Jesus said the devil did it, but I've come that you might have life and have it to you more abundantly. God didn't have anything to do with that, except he's still loving you and protecting you and trying to restore you and get you to recover everything. Good measure, press down, shaken together, and run it over. But religion will make it sound holy. How many of you ever read dumb stuff like that or heard it in the church on TV? Yeah. It's just stupid. Yeah. Yeah. God's the one making people sick now. And the devil's the one. Woo! Don't go down to that full gospel Pentecostal. Don't go over that clarion church. They don't have a church bell kind of people up in there dancing and shouting, getting healed up in that That devil healing those people. Acts 10.38, let's ask Peter. He walked with Jesus for three and a half years. Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all those oppressed of the devil. Oh, yes, yes. Everybody that he was oppressed of the devil. You never saw one time someone come to Jesus and said, no, keep that. I'm trying to teach you something. <laughs> Jesus said it. Yeah. Philip said, Jesus, show us the Father. Philip says, Philip, have you been such a long time with me? 
and says thou showest the Father, have I been so long time and you don't know me? If you see me, you've seen the Father. Amen. They didn't even have, they wouldn't even pronounce God's name. They got so religious. They forgot his name. The Jews thought it was so holy. You couldn't even say it. They forgot it. And Jesus came to say, I didn't just came to give you a revelation of God. I came to give you a revelation that he's your father. Yeah. Father, father, father. He talks about father all the time. Yeah. Father all the time. Father. Even when we call that, uh, we call him the prodigal son, but he's lost his inheritance. Uh, he ended up with a pig. So he's living a wild life with women. And it says when he comes back to the father, the father sees him afar off and runs. That means he was looking for him. Yeah. Means he was looking for him. And ran toward him, wrapped his arm around him, kissed him, and said, clothe him with the best clothes. Yes. Put shoes, this is covenant language, by the way, put a new coat on him, clothe him with new shoes, and he looks and says, go kill the fatty cat, cut blood. Yeah. And he's got all type of poor man and all type of cattle, but notice the words he, the. The, T-H-E, fatty cat. And they knew which one in the words the best. Yes. Yes. This my son. And listen to the son. Hold on. I know I messed up. I know I lost everything. And all I need, I don't even need to be your son. I'm not even good enough to be your son. Just let me be your servant. And while he's talking, it says the father didn't even pay attention to him. All that mess, he didn't even listen to. He just turns around and says, go kill the fatty cat. This my son who was lost is now found. The son was talking sin. The father was talking son. Yes. Yes. You're not going to impress God. When he sent his son and gave his best and cleansed and paid for everything and paid for your sins, past, present, and future, and sickness and disease, and you go up telling God how bad you are and how no good you are, and, you're, and, and all that religious junk, we've been taught it. We've been taught it. That's right. God still loves us and says, don't he know I've already killed the fetic? Don't he know I've already shed the blood? Don't he know that's not who he is? Don't he know he's more than a conqueror? Don't he know he's already healed? Don't he know he's already blessed? Don't he know that he's not condemned and I'm not condemning him? God never, ever, ever will condemn you. Yeah, that's right. Amen. So, so the new covenant, he said he has cleansed us, perfected us, and sanctified us once and for all, forever. Let me ask you a question. How long is forever? Forever. And he says, and I will remember your sins and iniquity no more. What does no more mean? No more. That's past, present, and future. What does God say about you? You're perfect and you're sanctified. That means cleansed. That means already holy. That means set apart. You pray, oh God, cleanse me. Oh God, you can't get more cleansed than the blood. That's right. Amen. He says the blood has been sprinkled on our hearts so we can enter into the holiness and come with full assurance of faith. When you get the revelation, the blood of Jesus has freed you and made you righteous and pure and you've got boldness, it gives you full assurance of faith. Because you know God's not mad at you. God's for you. He's not against you. And he says, you can enter the holiness. If you can enter the holiest, the inner sanction of God's heaven, then you have to be holy to get into the holy. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Ain't no sinners going in there. Right. And you ain't no sinner. Right. Touch yourself and say, he's made me perfect. Made me I'm sanctified. Yes. I'm righteous. Right. And holy. holy. God says I am. <laughs> so I say I am. So I say I am. Hey, come here, brother. So you have to look at everything through the lenses of the cross, the blood. Look, you see how bright the room is, all the lights are on? Put that on and tell me what happens. It's pretty dark. Because <laughs> they're called shades. Right. It shades. When you look through the lenses of these glasses, everything is going to be colored. To the tint of those glasses. Now, put these on. Oh, <laughs> it's clear. It's clear. Yeah, it's clear. 
<laughs> if this is legalism and law, and that's what you've been taught, you everything's up to you. You got to do it. You got to do everything right. You got to pray three hours a day, or God will be mad at you. You got to, and you understand, we ain't telling you not to pray and not to read your Bible. I'm telling you, that's not what made God love you because you wasn't doing that. He loves you because He wants a relationship with you. He loves you, paying for you. Doing that doesn't make God love you more and won't make Him bless you more. He's already blessed us. That's why it's a faith and not law. Faith grabs hold of what he's done. But if you've been told you've got to do it and you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you can't do this and you look at everything through these glasses of law, then that's how everything's going to look. No matter how good people tell you God is, you put you see everything through this, so you still see. You can hear, I've heard people, people come to my church for months and years, and I'm preaching on the goodness of God, and will still come up and tell me how God's judging them, and how and they want me to pray with them, because God wrecked the car. And, I'll, and I'm thinking, I'm going, man, I love you, but what church have you been going to? I've seen you there every Sunday, and I'm like, oh, for 10 years now, because they still bless their hearts. Some preacher beat them up, or some religion beat them up. And we all got our own, you know, we got our full gospel glasses, we got our Pentecostal glasses, we got our Catholic glasses, we got our Baptist. So whatever anybody says, we'll see it through our glasses. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Somebody will preach the word, and they can read it in their Bible, and see it just like about healing and miracles and everything, and put this on and say, miracles are over. The day of miracles of over. God doesn't heal. There never was a day of miracles. It's a God of miracles. Yes. And he changes not. Yes. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. Oh, come on, yes. But when you put on grace glasses, it just clears everything up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It just clears everything. It just opens your eyes and you're going, wow. What are you talking about? I'm telling you, this is what made me free. This is what made me free. I know I didn't. It's all right if I just float tonight? Yes, yes. Go read. We'll read these scriptures. Hopefully, we'll, we're going to get more into that next time. But, but let me just read this scripture to you. And then I'm going to say something and I'll, I'll, I'll close. Ephesians 2. I'm reading out of the Amplified Version. Listen to this. You listening? Ephesians 2, New Testament. Everybody say New Testament. New Testament. New Testament. How does God relate to you when you pray? How does God see you when you pray? He sees you pure. He sees you favored, highly favored. He sees you perfect. He sees you sanctified once and for all, forever. That's in your Bible. That's all through the book of Hebrews. Once and for all. And it says that he sat down. The priests in the Old Testament, their work was 24 hours a day. They never, they, there was no chair in the Old Testament temple because you didn't sit down. They had to continually offer the blood of bulls and goats because people were sitting and filling. And if they didn't have blood over them, God's judgment would come. But our high priest sat and has finished and perfected us and sanctified us once and for all. What does it mean? You go before a seated high priest. His name is Jesus. Meaning that he doesn't have to offer his blood over and over again. He's already done it. And he's at rest. And he has raised us up and seated us with him. Isn't it something? Here. Let me read this. Ephesians 2 verse 6. Can you take this a few more moments? Yes. yes. And he raised us up. Somebody shall bless me. Yes, he raised us up together. I call it the together with gospel. He raised us up together with him and made us sit down together with him. Given us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere. The religion teaches us you got to do. That's the starting place. Do something to get it. Jesus teaches it starts with resting. It starts with seeing. You've been seated with him, therefore it's yours. It's not doing and you get it. You see 
You're seated. You're seated with him. So all things are yours. You're entering into the rest. Somebody shout, I've got the rest. I got the rest. I got the rest. We're seated together with him. Listen, surpassing that we might come to the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace. Yes. His unmerited favor yes. in his kindness, in his goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 54, he says, I'll never be mad at you again. I'll never be angry. God's never, ever angry at you. God's never, ever, he'll never be angry. That's Isaiah 54. Isaiah 53, he hung on a cross, our substitute. Isaiah 54, he said, thus said the Redeemer. This is the one resurrected talking. He said, I'll never be angry with you again. I'll never touch yourself. Say, God's never going to be angry with me. And he's not angry with me now. He said, well, but, but I messed up. But the blood has paid for it, and he don't see you messed up. He sees you forgiven. He can't even see that. He sees the blood. Uh, his kindness. His kindness. Watch this. For it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor, that you are delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourself or your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but through the will of God. No more judgment. Somebody shout no more judgment. No more judgment. I mean, I had a pile of scriptures, but let me, let me end with these two examples. Have you ever noticed in the Old Testament, God's men, there was God's men, but it lays out because it was under the Old Testament, and sometimes it was under the law, but it shows us their sins. David's adultery, men and women, their sins and the things they did. Abraham lied twice, saying Sarah was his sister. To save his own skin, his son Isaac, he lies. And he names the men and women, and it tells us their sins. Did you notice when we get to the New Testament, it has those same men in Hebrews 11, and not one time, because now it's after the cross. Everybody say after the cross. After the cross. What are we doing? We're looking through the lenses of the cross and the blood. When Jesus died on the cross, it went back and paid all the sins in the past. And the present. And all the sins you or anybody else is ever going to commit. It paid for the sins of all these men. So in the Old Testament, it tells us their sins. In the New Testament, the same men. The same men. In Hebrews 11, the chapter of eight, Not one time. Not once. Not once. Find it out. Eat it. Not once. Not once does it name one sin. It says there are men of faith. Champions. They accomplish great things. Accomplish signs, wonders, and earth. Because now... God is showing us through the blood what the cross has accomplished. He no longer sees their sins and failures. He sees them as champions because of the blood. Yes. In the Old Testament, here's the picture. Say this with me. Mercy and grace, Mercy and grace. always triumphs. Always triumphs. Over judgment. Over judgment. Say it again. Mercy and grace. Mercy and grace. Always, Always. Triumphs. Triumphs. Over law and judgment. Law and judgment. You know what the Ark of the Covenant is, most of you? But just real quick. God said, okay, take the Ark, put three things in it. He said, put the pot of manna, which was God's blessing. But it was a picture of man's rebellion because they said, we want something else. They called it foolish. They hated it and rebelled against God. It had Aaron's rod because other men raised up and said, we want to be the leaders. God said, Who put your name on the rod, and it was just a stick. But God made a dead stick blossom, a picture of resurrection. But it was a picture of resurrection concerning mankind, two pictures of resurrection. And here's the third thing, the most important. The Ten Commandments, the law, it's pure, it's holy, but man's not. And it points out man's rebellion and his sinfulness. And when God sees the law, then there's no blood, judgment comes. So God put a lid, he said, put a lid on it. Call it the mercy seat. 
and put blood on top. When Jesus in the New Testament is called a perpetuation, you've ever read that before? Mm -hmm. You know what that means? God is satisfied with everything Jesus did on the cross in his death, burial, and resurrection. God is satisfied. Say that with me. God is satisfied. God is satisfied. God is satisfied. <laughs> so when Jesus said it's finished, he meant it's finished. One translation says, he is God's mercy seat. So they would sprinkle the blood on top of the mercy seat because God says, when I see the blood, I see the blood. He said, the life is in the blood. If there was no blood there, he would see judgment and judgment would come on all the people and they would be killed. You got it? So he put the mercy seat and sprinkled blood. So when he looked at that, he saw mercy and grace. There was a time the ark went into a little village. And some of the people went and lifted the mercy seat. God forbid people to lift the mercy seat and look into the ark. And they lifted the mercy seat. And it says, and they looked into the ark. And when they did, every one of them was destroyed and dropped dead. Because God never made you to look to the law. Because Paul said in the 2 Corinthians 3 and the New Testament, the law is a ministry of guilt, death, and condemnation. When you preach the law, don't do this, don't do that. It brings guilt and condemnation to you. They drop dead. It's death. He never made you, even in the Old Testament, he didn't want you to look in at the judgment and the law and look to it. So he covered it because mercy is always on top of judgment. And isn't it something today, Christian bookstores and us, we'll get Ten Commandments and big posters and nail it on our walls in our house and put it up and we or exposing the law instead of scriptures about mercy and grace. Because mercy and grace is what God delights in. The Bible says he delights in mercy, not in judgment. Your God doesn't want you to look into the law. It brings death and condemnation. God wants you to look to his grace and mercy. It brings freedom and it brings liberty and it brings victory. Come on up in here, Jim. Come on, let's give God some praise.